Can I ask you to turn to Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, so that's going further on in the Bible after the book of Psalms. Uh, it's, uh, we're taking communion, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. This is for Christians. If you're a Christian this morning, if you believe solely in Jesus Christ as your salvation, salvation if you know it's only by faith and by grace, then uh, you can join with us in this, this meal. So, Isaiah chapter 53, and uh, we'll begin our reading at verse 10 to verse 12. These are the verses that we're looking at this morning. So, that's page 742. If you have a church Bible, we'll begin our reading at verse 10. Let's listen to God's Word. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great." And he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So once again, we're returning to this uh, uh, lovely chapter of the Bible. It's uh, one of the greatest and perhaps the most important chapter in the Old Testament. And it's one of those chapters that we can't afford to miss or misunderstand because this chapter, Isaiah chapter 53, lies at the heart of Christianity. Now, every part of the Bible is, is important. Every chapter is inspired by God. In other words, it originates from God. It's God-breathed. Every chapter in the Old Testament is important because, again, it's inspired by God. It comes from God. But there are some portions of Scripture some chapters, some verses that are, more, that are more important and more useful than others. And the reason that they're more important and more useful is because they speak about Jesus Christ with a lot more clarity. Isaiah chapter 53 clearly speaks about Jesus Christ. Now, the reason that Isaiah 53 is so important is, is, is because it tells us everything that we need to know and believe so we can be right with God. This is why this chapter is so important. The whole chapter centers upon the work and the person of Jesus Christ and what he came to do. And it tells us if we believe in what he did, if we believe in these verses, we can be saved from our sins and have peace with God. Now, the biggest question that's occupied this country and the world for the last year is, how can we be saved from the virus? That's been our biggest concern, and we've listened to the experts, haven't we? They've been on the television, they've told us their opinion. We've listened to the commentators, and we have a whole host of regulations telling us how we can be saved from the virus. I'm sure we've heard it all, and I'm sure some of you are, are experts on how to be saved from this virus. And it looks as though we have a savior. A vaccine has come into the world. And if we believe in the science, if we believe in the vaccine, if we accept the vaccine, if we receive the vaccine, we shall be saved. Our knight in shining armor has arrived. But I'm here this morning to tell you there's a greater threat to our lives than the virus. It's worse and it's even more deadly than anything we've come across in the whole history of mankind. It's even worse than what we've experienced in this last year, and it's called sin. It's our sin, it's my sin, it's your sin. This is the biggest threat to our lives. And no matter what the media tell us, no matter what your own heart tells you, no matter what your own experience tells us, our biggest problem today is our relationship with God. 
Our problem is our sin because it's our sin that separates us from God. And because our sin has separated us from God, we don't know Him, we have a misunderstanding of Him, and sadly we don't even want to know Him. We've turned our backs on Him. And because we've turned our backs on Him, we loathe Him, and we deserve to be eternally separated from Him. That's what we all deserve. And it's an eternal separation because sin, our sin, my sin, is infinitely offensive to God and His holiness. We must remember this. Sin isn't something that's trivial or something that we can just brush under the carpet and think it doesn't matter. Our sin is serious. Our sin is a killer. And why do we have this problem with sin? It's because we've been born in the wrong family. We've been born in Adam. God sees us in Adam. God has made a judgment and all of Adam, all those who belong to Adam, have rebelled against God. That's how we're born into this life. We've been born as rebels against God. We bear the same family characteristic as Adam. We love ourselves, we ignore God, and we turn our backs on Him. And because we're in Adam, because we love sin, there's this great big chasm between ourselves and God. Now Isaiah chapter 53 tells us everything we need to know and believe so we're no longer separated from God. He tells us what God had planned to do in the Lord Jesus Christ so that that chasm would be bridged, and we could be right with God. Isaiah chapter 53 is God's way of reconciling the sinner to himself. And if we believe what's written here in Isaiah chapter 53, we will find peace with God and be reconciled with God. And we'll no longer be enemies of God, but we'll have a faith that justifies us. Now, we've looked almost at all of the chapter. It's our final week in this lovely chapter. And we're going to look at these uh, last three verses that we've read. And if we can remember, we started our little study in Isaiah chapter 53 by actually looking at Isaiah chapter 52. And it was there that we were told straight away, because it's part of the same song about the suffering servant, we're told straight away that uh, God's special servant, this is to Jesus Christ, this is the Messiah, God's anointed, even though he's going to be disfigured, even though he's going to have this appearance where he'll not be recognized, he will be successful. All right, his mission of reconciling God and man and man and God will be successful. Then at the start of uh, chapter 53, we saw Jesus' mission and, mis- and uh, message would be rejected. Instead of, instead of being accepted, he would be despised. The Son of God, God's anointed servant, God's chosen servant, God's answer to the world, God's answer to our problem would be despised and rejected. Then from verses 4 to 6, we're told why Jesus was willing to be treated badly. It wasn't because of something that he'd done. He was willing to be despised and rejected and humiliated because of us. We're we're described as the sheep that have gone astray and turned to our own way. And to solve our problem of turning away from God, Jesus would would come into this world and be our substitute. He'd come into the world and be punished in our place. This is the heart of the gospel, the good news to mankind, that Jesus would come and be punished in our place. And then in verses 7 to 9, we read about Jesus' voluntary death. All right, he went voluntary to the cross. He went, he was willing to die. We also learn that it's an unjust death. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't go protesting but he was like a lamb that gladly followed its shepherd. 
Now we come to verses 10 and 12. And the major theme here in these verses is the reward that Jesus will receive for dying and being punished for sinners. It's all about his, the, res, the reward he'll receive. Now we're reminded straight away that it was the Lord's will to crush him. We were told this in verse 5. In verse 5 we read, He was crushed for our iniquities. Now what was that crushing? It was that his soul was crushed. If we remember a few weeks back, we looked at Psalm 88, didn't we? And we read about the psalmist being in great agony. And what was his agony? It was that God wasn't listening to him. He was pouring his heart out to God. He was going through troubles. But God wasn't listening to the psalmist. He felt abandoned by God. He tells us that darkness was his closest friend. This was the crushing that Jesus went through when he went to the cross. He was being crushed. Yes, you could say he was being crushed in his body. He was being flogged and spat on and beaten and abused. But his greatest crushing was that of it in his soul. And it was even worse than what the psalmist experienced because Jesus had always enjoyed intimate communion with his Father. Now in verse 10 we're being told something about that crushing. In verse 10 we're being told that it was the Lord's will to crush him. That's an amazing truth, isn't it? Now this tells us why Jesus didn't resist going to the cross, knowing that he would be abandoned by God. Imagine looking into the future and you knew that there was going to be a time, an afternoon, a few hours where God would abandon you. What would be your thoughts? Well, that's not God's will for my life. Jesus knew it was God's will for his life that he would be abandoned by God when he was on the cross. He knew it was the Lord's will. And because he knew it was the Lord's will, he, wasn't, he didn't hesitate about accepting Judas the man who would hand him over to the religious authorities. He had no fear about Jesus, uh, Judas being one of his disciples because he knew it was the Lord's will that this man would be an agent for him being handed over and crushed. Neither did Jesus de defend himself before the high priest, the Sanhedrin, neither before Herod or Pilate because he knew it was God's will to go to the cross. Now, Jesus could have defended himself. Jesus was a master with words. He was a master with reason. He was a master with logic. Remember when the woman was caught in adultery? He defended her. When the woman dried his feet with her hair, he, he defended her. The whole of his trial was a scam. Jesus could have defended himself. He could have tied them all in knots. But he didn't. He didn't even resist the death sentence. He didn't ask his disciples. He didn't go and say, John, I can see you, John, in the crowd. Just go and get a good lawyer. Bring up a good case. He didn't even appeal against his death sentence. He could have called down 12 legions of angels, but he didn't. He knew it was the Lord's will to be crushed and he never opposed it. Now I hope that if we're a Christian, I hope that moves us. I hope that never ever leaves us cold. Jesus didn't resist going to the cross and being crushed because he knew it was the Lord's will so that we could be saved. Well, that is a marvelous, marvelous truth. Don't ever say God doesn't love me. He sent his one and only begotten son to be crushed so that I could be right with God. And why did Jesus know it was the Lord's will? It's because it had been planned in all eternity. Peter tells us, Pell tells the crowd on the day of Pentecost that Jesus was handed over to be killed because it was God's deliberate plan. 
It was his deliberate plan. It had been planned in eternity. The Lord had planned it to happen for Jesus to be handed over and killed. God let wicked men have their way. He let the wicked religious leaders pursue their envy and their, and their power to the full. He let Pilate have that sinful pleasure of bowing down to the demands of the crowd. He allowed the soldiers to express their thuggery and macho-ness and their hardness by beating Jesus Christ. Why didn't Jesus resist these wicked men? It's because he knew it was the Lord's will to crush him and be an offering for sin. And because Jesus does the will of God, he's rewarded. God gives him what he deserves for doing God's will. Now when we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're a disciple of him, when we said Jesus is my Lord and my Master and we've surrendered everything to him, when we put him first, do you know there's a reward? Do you know there's a reward? And what is that reward? Well, the biggest reward, the greatest reward of being a Christian is being able to say, I belong to Jesus. It's to say, he is mine and I am his. But the thing about our reward is it's all based on grace. We don't deserve that reward. But Jesus did deserve his reward. He was fully worthy of the reward that he would receive for laying his life down for us. He's done a great work. His was deserving. Ours is all based on unmerited, something that we don't deserve. Now, what are we told about Jesus' reward? Well, there are numerous. There isn't just one, but there are many. There's one after the other in these verses. So what are his, his rewards? Well, the first reward that's mentioned is he'll have offspring. Or we may have a translation of the Bible where it may say seed. Now, the word offspring or seed means he'll have children. He'll have descendants. Now, if we're familiar with the Gospels, we know that Jesus didn't marry. All right? He didn't come, he didn't come to this world to marry. But he'll have descendants. And those in his family won't be related to him because of something in their DNA or their genes. Isaiah is telling us there'll be a spiritual relationship between ourselves, those who are Christians, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the significance of having this spiritual relationship with Jesus is that we're no longer in Adam. We're no longer united with Adam. We're no longer seen as, as being in Adam and judged under Adam. God judged Adam, and because God judged Adam, the whole of mankind has been judged. But because we are children of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we are united to Him, because there is this mystical union between us and Him, our status before God changes. And because our status changes, so do our characteristics. And then we're told that God will prolong his days. Obviously, Isaiah is, is telling us about the resurrection. He's foretelling the resurrection of Jesus. And he tells us more about that in verse 11 because he says, After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. He will see life. Foretelling the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He will come alive. And then in verse 9 we're told Jesus will be assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And again he's telling us how Jesus will be put to death. He'll be killed with the wicked people. And that's what happened. Crucifixion was only reserved for criminals. It was, it was for, for wicked people. Those who died with Jesus were called thieves. They were rebels. Jesus was outside the city walls. He was numbered with the transgressors like we read in verse 12. And then we read he was buried. When we read the Gospels, the Gospel of John, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. 
But his death and his burial wasn't the end. He rose from the dead. And later the apostles saw him, and so did over 500 people witness the fact that Jesus Christ came alive. And because he's ascended to heaven, he's still alive. And then Isaiah tells us at the end of verse 10 more about his prolonged life. Look what we read. It's a rich and prosperous life because the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. In other words, after Jesus has done his work of dying in the place of sinners, after he's risen from the dead, after he's ascended and been seated at the right of the hand of God, he's become the chief executor of doing God's will. He is the manager, he's the one, he's the, he's the, one, the chief executive so to speak, of God's kingdom and God's will. He's the one who's in charge. He's the one who executes God's will upon the earth. And so he can execute, execute God's will upon this earth. Like we read of in Matthew 28, when he sends out the disciples, he's been given all power and authority to do so. It's amazing. He's the one who is in absolute control. And then in verse 11, we're told something remarkable about Jesus' reward. He will be satisfied. We read, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. I'm sure we've all had the experience of doing something and it's been very satisfying. Or alternatively, we know what it's like to do something and it's been completely a waste of time and unsatisfying. You know, we put our energy into making a lovely meal, but we forgot to set the timer. And what happens? It burns. Some of you are nodding in agreement. Or we've done a lovely piece of homework. And what have we done? We spilt, it. We spilt something on it. We spoilt it. Or we've left it on the tram or on the bus. Complete waste of time. We planted some uh, new plants or some bedding plants in the garden. We've got aches and pains to show for it. In a few weeks' time, they've been eaten by slugs and snails. Complete dissatisfaction in what we've done. But when Jesus looks at what he's done, he's satisfied. All that pain and agony and turmoil and misunderstanding... He knows that leaving heaven and living as a man and being judged and left by God and being punished as a sinner has been worth it because he knows that helpless sinners like me and you are saved and made right with God. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus doesn't look upon his ministry upon this earth and think, oh, I wish I had to come. They've made a mess of it again. They don't appreciate everything that I've done for them. That's not how Jesus thinks. It's amazing, isn't it? He doesn't regret humbling himself, being misunderstood. It brings him great satisfaction that he's done the work that he's done so that we can be saved. Now, have we ever seen ourselves as bringing satisfaction to Jesus? Has it ever crossed your your mind? Now, if we want Jesus to be satisfied with us, do you know the answer? The answer is by believing in His Son, believing in His work, believing with all your heart, Isaiah chapter 53. And if we believe everything that Isaiah tells us, everything that God tells us about His Son, God, God's Son, takes great satisfaction in us. Jesus was delighted to go to the cross to justify sinners. But then it doesn't stop there because in verse 12 we're told, that Jesus has another reward. We read, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Now, at first glance, this verse may appear to be a a bit of a letdown. It's as though Jesus is just one of many. He's done this great work, all right? 
it's an amazing job that he's done. He's executed it perfectly. He's carried out God's will. He hasn't deviated to the left or to the right. He's achieved everything that he, he set out to do, that God had planned to happen. And it would appear that he's just one of many. Could you imagine if you ran a race in the Olympics and everybody got a gold medal? It's, it's what you do at school now, isn't it? I've heard, all right. Everybody has to win, don't they, or something? All right. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. It's probably my, my way of looking at things. It, that's, that's how it appears, doesn't it? But that's not the case. I came across a scholar who uh, interpret, well, wrote this, the Hebrew, a little bit differently because there's more to it than that. This scholar translated the verse like this. Therefore I will allocate to him the many and the strong I will apportion as spoil. In other words, the great we have in our translations can be translated as many and the many are his reward. And the word strong can be also translated as many or as the NIV translates it in the footnote, it can be translated as numerous. And what the verse is telling us is that the many and the numerous and the strong are his spoil. They're his reward. You know, like when an army used to go into battle and they conquered the enemy. Not only would they defeat the enemy, they'd win the spoils of victory. Jesus has been victorious. What are his spoils of war? He'll receive many, and he'll receive the strong. Well, Jezire is telling us, in other words, he'll receive all those he had come to die for. They're his spoil. His people are his reward. They are the many. They are the special people. His special people will come to him and be saved, and he'll be the, their, his, their savior, and they'll be his. Now, in some respects, Jesus is the Savior of all men. Just like we read in that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul mentions that uh, Jesus is the Savior of all men. It sometimes uh, tied some Christians in perpetual knots. As this word. The number of times I've discussed this with people and there's been a, a bit of a misunderstanding. Jesus is the Savior of all men. And he's the saviour of all men because he's to be offered as the saviour of all men. All men, boys and girls, it doesn't matter who we are, Jesus is to be offered as the saviour of all sinners. We can be a hard sinner, we can be an entrenched sinner, we can be an ignorant sinner, it doesn't matter what kind of sinner we are, it doesn't matter how long our record is, it doesn't matter how bad we are. It doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter about our background. The invitation is Jesus can be your Savior. He's the Savior of all men. One of the greatest tragedies any church, any Christian can fall into is to say to a person, you can't come to Jesus Christ and be saved. You can come. Come as you are. Come to Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter about your past in coming to Christ. Come as you are. He loves to save sinners. The greatest tragedy we can say to any unconverted person is just go away, sort yourself out, and then come back. He's the Savior of all men, and He's come to save. If you feel in a pit this morning, if your guilt is screaming at you, if your sins are blinding you, don't look at your sins. Look at the love of God in Jesus Christ, and He will save you. And all those sins will be cancelled out in God's economy because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came into this world to pay for the sins of his people. But also Jesus is the saviour to his special people, to a particular group of people. Or as Paul mentions it in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, he's the saviour of all people especially of those who believe. And he's their saviour because Jesus was given a people to die for. His work on the cross, when he went to the cross and he died, 
It was for those people God the Father had given him to die for. And the people who had been given to him are his spoil, are his reward. It's amazing, Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 39, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus doesn't say everyone was given to him. Only his sheep hear his voice. And they hear his voice because they were given to Jesus. Isn't that reassuring about our salvation? God gave them to Jesus to die for. They're his sheep and they're his reward. I don't know if you've been to the Peak District recently. I hope you haven't, but you might have done. But uh, we'll not go into the details of where you've been and where you've not been. But when you go to the Peak District, there are many sheep farms, aren't there? And I will guarantee you this, if you went to Bill's sheep farm or Pete's sheep farm or Joe Bloggs sheep farm, that when Bill looks after his sheep, Bill looks after his sheep. He doesn't travel the moors and thinks, right, I'm going to start looking after Pete's sheep and Bill's sheep and, and Joe's sheep. He looks after Bill's sheep. Sorry, I'm getting my mind names. But anyway, you, you get the gist, don't you? Bill looks after his sheep. Bill cares for his sheep. And Bill will certainly lay down his life for his sheep. He will get up at silly hours to look after his sheep. Jesus has his sheep. He loves his sheep. And he died for his sheep. Just before Jesus is crucified, he says in John chapter 17 and verse 9, I am not praying for the world. In other words, I'm going to be particular in my prayers. I'm praying for those you have given me now we're going to come to the Lord's Supper do we see ourselves as part of Jesus' reward we're his trophies of grace you've probably heard that expression before haven't you this is his reward for reconciling us to God now there are many people and we come across them often, don't we? You may be one yourself. You don't feel valued. You feel worthless. You feel life is meaningless and pointless. Now, if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we put our, our faith and our trust in what He has done, you are valued. Can you see the whole point here? You belong to Him. You may not belong to anybody at the moment. Your family may despise you and reject you. Your children may reject you. Your grandchildren may. Your colleagues at work may reject you. You may be living on your own. People may misunderstand you. But believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are Christ's reward. You are valued. Believe in this Lord Jesus Christ that is offered to you in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only are you with the reward of Jesus, but Jesus is your reward. We belong to Him. And the great thing we read is He's pleased to save us when we come to Him. He has no regrets in saving us from our sins. Now as we come and as we celebrate, one of the things that we do, what's... Uh, what makes us do it, it focuses our minds. And a chapter like this focuses our minds on something very special about us, well, something very important about ourselves. And the thing that it focuses when we become a Christian, when we believe in this chapter, is that it, 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 it delivers us from pride. It delivers, delivers us from puffing ourselves up. 
what it, what, it, what it drives us to is gratitude. He's pleased to save us. He has no regrets in saving us. We're his reward. And why are we his reward? It's because he was obedient in doing the will of the Father. And when we examine ourselves, when we come to this meal, we will know, it won't take us very long to realize that we've made a mess of things. It might not be on the outside, but it will certainly be on the inside. And this drives us to the fact, this points us to the person who can save us from all our sins, both yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. He's our answer. And this is what this meal points us to. He's lifted me. He's lifted you from a slimy pit. He's put your feet upon a rock. You have a firm foundation to stand on. Can I exhort you to stand upon it? And he's given you a firm place to stand. Can I encourage you to stand on it? Let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we? Oh, Father in heaven, we do thank you for this lovely chapter, Isaiah chapter 53, that speaks of Jesus and his ministry and his willingness to lay down his life for us. And Father, we're very conscious, very, very conscious that we don't deserve it. Because of him we are righteous. Because of everything that he's done we are saved. And that we've been justified, we have been declared righteous because of his work. Oh, Heavenly Father, deliver us, we pray, from pride and puffing ourselves up. May we remember that we are Christ's reward because of grace, because of Jesus. And Father, as we enjoy this meal together, may we feed on the benefits and the privileges and the blessings. Father, not only in what you give, but in knowing him who is a great Savior. Father, we do ask this for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen.